Carbohydrates Absorption. We'll now review the topic of carbohydrate absorption and glucose tissue uptake, particularly the uptake of glucose from the muscle. The carbohydrate components involved in the process of absorption are the monosaccharides glucose, galactose, and fructose. These are absorbed by the villi and microvilli of the small intestine, also known as the enterocyte. Glucose and galactose are absorbed via active transport, therefore requiring ATP, through the sodium glucose transporter 1, or SGLT1. The process differs for fructose. Fructose is absorbed through the brush border membrane of the enterocyte by facilitative diffusion. The carrier used to transport the fructose from the lumen of the small intestine through the brush border membrane of the intestinal cell is called GLUT5. The rate of absorption of fructose is slower than of glucose. However, that is only if fructose is present in the intestinal lumen on its own. When glucose and fructose are consumed together, the rate of fructose absorption increases. To keep this in context, it is actually rare that pure fructose is consumed. Largely, the fructose that is consumed in food products is largely present with glucose. We see here then fructose after being absorbed in the enterocyte is then transported into the bloodstream by GLUT2. And we'll go over a diagram. You can see in this diagram the process of carbohydrate absorption. And we see here three intestinal cells. And you can see on the intestinal cells here we have the brush border membrane of the small intestine, which contacts the lumen of the gut, which is where the digested food products are present prior to absorption. So we have our intestinal cell, also known as the enterocyte, and we have the brush border membrane. And then once the food components are absorbed into the enterocyte, we have the second membrane, which contacts the blood, called the basolateral membrane. And it's going to be important to go over these terms because I'll be referring to the term the enterocyte, which means the intestinal cell, the lumen of the small intestine, the brush border membrane of the enterocyte, and then also the basolateral membrane of the small intestine. Therefore, to review, and again, this is diagramming carbohydrate absorption, we see that glucose and galactose are primarily absorbed through the sodium glucose transporter 1, or SGLT1, and that's diagrammed here. You can see that it's sodium dependent, but it's also ATP dependent. Fructose, on the other hand, is primarily absorbed by facilitative diffusion via the GLUT5 channel. So you see fructose having a different mechanism of entry through the different channels, so the GLUT5 versus the SGLT1, and this is not through active transport, it's through facilitated diffusion. Then we see after the monosaccharides enter the enterocyte, so we see the fructose entering, and then we see galactose and glucose entering the enterocyte, they need to exit the intestinal cell through the basolateral membrane. And then once passed through the basolateral membrane, the monosaccharides can then be present in the bloodstream. So we see that the primary channels used to transport the monosaccharides from the enterocyte into the bloodstream are the GLUT2 channels. So here we see a GLUT2, here's a GLUT2, and then another GLUT2 you see as indicated here. Here we'll see a table summarizing five of the 13 different GLUT channels in our body. And we just saw the activity by GLUT2 bringing the monosaccharides from the enterocyte into circulation through the basolateral membrane. And then also GLUT5, we saw how GLUT5 channel was used for the process of facilitated diffusion for fructose passing through the brush border membrane. For the purposes of this class, we will also be talking about GLUT4, which you can see here is insulin dependent and is present primarily on the muscle.
Now that the monosaccharides are circulating through the bloodstream, they need to be picked up by relevant tissues to allow for the conversion to ATP or other processes through the pathways of energy metabolism. A key tissue involved in the uptake of monosaccharides, particularly glucose, is the muscle tissue. The muscles where uptake of glucose is insulin dependent, again, as we saw involving the GLUT4 channel. In this process, the hormone insulin, which increases when blood glucose levels rise after eating a carbohydrate-containing meal, binds to the insulin receptor on the membrane of the muscle cell. When insulin binds to the insulin receptor, it signals a cascade of events within the cell, eventually leading to what's called the translocation of the GLUT4 channels from inside the muscle cell to the cell membrane. Once the GLUT4 channels are present on the membrane of the muscle cell, glucose can then enter the muscle cell and is available to undergo the subsequent reactions of energy metabolism, such as glycolysis, among other processes. This process of insulin-dependent glucose uptake by the cell plays a role in regulating blood glucose levels. So we can see in this diagram the process just described the insulin-dependent uptake of glucose by muscle cells. We see the hormone insulin, which again increases after consuming a carbohydrate-containing meal, and we see insulin binding to the insulin receptor on the membrane of the muscle cell. So this is the outer membrane again of the muscle cell. We see the insulin receptor, and then we see the insulin binding to the insulin receptor. This in turn activates a cascade of events, eventually leading to what's called the translocation of GLUT4 channels into the membrane of the muscle cell. So you can see here this is a, a ring, also known as a vesicle, containing these GLUT4 channels embedded in this ring structure. And so again, with the binding of insulin to the insulin receptor, it activates a series of events then promoting the unfolding or opening of this ring and translocating the GLUT4 channels into the cell membrane. And now that the GLUT4 channels are in the membrane of the cell, we can have glucose monosaccharide then entering through these channels within the muscle cell. It is at this point that the glucose then can be used for further processes of energy metabolism, so glucose can enter the pathway of glycolysis. Through the pathway of glycolysis, we have ATP production. However, in more of an energy surplus state, where we're in more of a tissue storage process, a tissue storage metabolic environment, the glucose can actually be used to form glycogen. This process is called glycogenesis. Glucose can also be converted to acetyl-CoA and converted to fat via fatty acid synthesis. While the primary mode of glucose entry into the muscle cell is through the insulin-dependent process of translocating the GLUT4 channels as we just discussed, there's actually another insulin-independent method of translocating the GLUT4 channels to the cell membrane of the muscle tissue. While this process is not fully understood, it is recognized that calcium secreted from the sarcoplasmic reticulum as a result of muscle contraction during exercise also promotes the translocation of the GLUT4 channels. So here's the image of a muscle cell. You can see the vesicles holding the GLUT4 channels, and you can see how they then become translocated to the cell membrane. And we see calcium here exiting from sarcoplasmic reticulum in response to muscle contraction. So we have muscle contraction, we have calcium being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is used both in the actual process of muscle contraction, but can also, this calcium, signal a cascade of events, potentially activating the translocation of these GLUT4 channels to the cell membrane. And again, this process is not fully understood in detail. However, there is some evidence suggesting this insulin independent pathway or mechanism of the translocation of the GLUT4 channels to the cell membrane.